Welcome to Minnesota Vikings Chat, the podcast of minnesotavikingschat.com. I'm your host, David Erickson, the publisher of Minnesota Vikings Chat, and in episode number 11, uh, we'll discuss the Vikings uh, linebacker situation. Joe Webb switched to wide receiver from quarterback to wide receiver. Uh, Chris Cluey signed with another team. Uh, the Packers may have a new reality show. And, uh, of course, we'll close with the Vikings' uh, new stadium design. Uh, so uh, the Vikings linebacker situation. Uh, Aaron Henderson made news this week um, by uh, saying in an interview with uh, uh, 1500ESPN.com that he's pissed. Uh, he's angry. Uh, I'll read you the quote from the article and uh, or from the interview. And we'll go from there. I haven't been more pissed in I couldn't tell you. I don't think I've ever been this pissed in my entire life to just hear people talk about stuff that they have no idea what they're talking about. I guess it's getting to a point where it's like, dang, I just want a little bit of respect. I'm not asking you to call me the greatest linebacker to ever play the game yet. Maybe one day we might uh, get to that point, but show me a little bit of respect for what I've done and for what I've accomplished in this le league, end quote. Uh, so I find it is a little amusing. He's got a chip on his shoulder. It's, I guess, not surprising that he does. Uh, he uh, 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 earned a spot on the Vikings roster as an undrafted free agent. Uh, his brother, of course, E.J. Henderson, was a starting line, middle linebacker for the Vikings, so um, he had a bit of a sibling rivalry going on there. Uh, but he did make the team, uh, he did make the Vikings roster on a, on a roster that is weak at the linebacker position. And, you know, from my perspective, I'd have a lot more respect for, uh, for uh, Aaron Henderson if he'd, uh, if he'd respect his own assignments. Last year, we saw him uh, freelancing. We saw him leaving his receiver uncovered for wide open, easy touchdowns. All right? So, you know, respect your own position, respect the game, respect your assignments, cover who you're supposed to cover, and you might not get as much, uh, uh, as much disrespect as you feel that you... Um, that you feel that you're getting right now. Um, so I'm I, I am a little bit skeptical. He's coming in as the apparent uh, middle linebacker uh, position uh, is apparently his to lose. Um, I am I as I said I am skeptical of that because he hasn't proven he is uh, he has um, the discipline to uh, to stand his assignments. But um, not saying that he can't become a decent linebacker. I, I think he is a decent linebacker on again. Uh, a core that is a is a weak spot in the team, but uh, you know if you look back and look at uh, E.J. Henderson, uh, his first year as starting middle linebacker in 2004, he was completely lost. Uh, I remember a play against the Eagles, a goal line stand against the Eagles, where uh, Henderson was calling out the assignments and he turned his head left, and the play the ball snapped and the play went right by him, the, and the Eagles scored. So uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't paying attention when he should have been paying attention. Uh, the middle linebacker spot is a tough spot because it is it's the quarterback of the defense, so you need to you need to make sure everybody's in position. You get to call the plays and everything. So. So um, it's more complicated than other positions. Um, but you look at E.J. Henderson's example, and uh, and after that lost year, that year where he learned on the job, uh, he turned in a good year and a half of really, really good middle linebacker play. It was never the adequate uh, cover two linebacker that we middle linebacker that we needed to play, but uh, but he was he was dominant at times. Um, and uh, it's a position on the Vikings that hasn't been really filled um, in a dominant way since, like, 1999 with Ed McDaniel. Uh, so I decided to, as I was thinking about this middle linebacker position and, and where we are with uh, on the current roster, uh, to look back at some uh, 40 times because really that's what we're talking about with the cover two is you need to be fast enough to cover that deep seam down the middle. Uh, E.J. Henderson couldn't do it. Jasper Brinkley definitely couldn't do it. And what we really want of our middle linebackers to be able to do that. So um, going through the 40 times that I've, that I've researched here, E.J. Henderson, uh, his combine 40 time was 4.8 seconds, 40-yard dash. Um, so that sort of explains that, right? Jasper Brinkley... 
I looked at Brinkley's uh, combine numbers, and he had surprisingly to me 4.67 40-yard dash at the combine. I looked at that, and I thought that cannot be correct because he did not have that speed on the field uh, when he played uh, for the Vikings. When he was the middle linebacker last year, he was not that fast. Uh, but then I remembered he had hip surgery. He lost a whole year due to hip surgery in the uh, in 2011 season. He lost uh, due to that. Uh, apparently it was a hip labral tear. Um, the Vikings had moved up in the 2009 draft uh, to pick um, Jasper Brinkley in the fifth round. They exchanged uh, fifth round picks with Washington and then gave uh, Washington their seventh round pick in order to move up a couple of spots and select uh, select Brinkley. So it's a he was a player that we really wanted. Um, and that four six seven combine speed was likely the reason why. But he got injured. Uh, and when he was given the starting spot in 2012, he proved that he wasn't fast enough. I mean, he, that injury likely slowed him down. He wasn't fast enough to cover the deep middle. Plus, he was, as Rick has pointed out in previous podcasts, he was the second worst linebacker in tackling in 2012. His 15, this is according to Pro Football Focus, his 15 missed tackles were the most among NFL linebackers. 15 missed tackles. So there's a reason we let him go. Uh, he was not very good as a as a run defender, and he couldn't cover the deep middle uh, in the middle linebacker. But clearly, the Vikings wanted somebody who had the speed to cover the deep middle. That's why they moved up to uh, to get him in 2009 with a 4.67 uh, combine 40 yard dash. So you look at the rest of the middle, the Vikings linebacker core, and what do we got is regarding speed? Chad Greenway is four had a, a 4.76 combine uh, 40 yard dash. Aaron Henderson. The heir apparent at middle linebacker had 4.73 combine 40 yard dash. So, you know, he's going to be improvement over uh, over um, Brinkley, who I think was probably slower than uh, E.J. Henderson's 4.8. Um, he's faster than, than Greenway. Um, so, you know, maybe he can cover that deep middle. I'm not saying he can't. I'd like to see it. Um, but you got to do something before you can you know demand respect. Adi Cole, seven uh, four point seven six combine dash. Adi Cole is sort of a dark horse uh, favorite among fans uh, because what he did in one preseason game against uh, uh, backup quarterbacks. So uh, there's that. Uh, but four point seven six uh, forty yard dash is not you know is not ideal. Tyrone McKenzie again four point seven six forty yard dash. Uh, Marvin Mitchell four point eight seven. 40-yard dash at the Combine, so that's not really going to work. This year's draft picks, uh, Gerald Hodges uh, had 4.78 Combine at uh, a 40-yard dash, but he also recorded a 4.7 Pro Day 40-yard uh, dash, so maybe there's a little bit more speed than that that, that looks than, uh, than it looks at the Combine. Uh, Michael Motti uh, had 4.79 40-yard dash. I don't know when or where that was recorded, but I don't think it was at the Combine because uh, he's coming off an ACL. And then finally, I saved the fastest for last. Larry Dean had a 4.5 Combine 40-yard dash. So if you're looking for speed to cover that deep middle uh, that, that we need out of our middle linebacker, Larry Dean's your guy. However... There's a reason he's been the special teams ace. Uh, he's five foot eleven, two hundred twenty six pounds. So um, he's not going to have the bulk you need in the middle linebacker. Uh, so that's that's likely why he hasn't had a chance, and um, and probably won't get a chance there. Um, so you know, uh, we'll see how that competition plays out. That's sort of uh, what we've got in the house right now with our with our linebacker linebacking core and what we need out of our uh, cover too. Um, so that also explains why we didn't draft uh, Manti Teo. And I go back to Manti Teo again because as I was doing um, this research and looking at 40-yard uh, times, I came across uh, Kevin Seifert, who is ESPN's uh, 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 NFC North blogger. And Seifert, if you'll remember, was a Vikings beat writer for the Star Tribune uh, not long ago. So uh, he presumably has a greater insight into uh, the Vikings than a lot of the national reporters do. Um, but uh, he was, uh, this is a quote on a piece of, uh, of um, 
of the Vikings linebacker situation uh, from Seifert. There was widespread and justified speculation that the Vikings would draft Notre Dame's Manti Teo, but the unpredictable first round brought them three players uh, they ranked higher on their board. Justified speculation. It sounds a little defensive to me. Uh, Kevin Seifert was among those most certain the Vikings would take Teo, and the Vikings passed on Teo. They passed on him three times. This drives me nuts because you know, it seemed obvious to me that they weren't going to take a slow guy for the middle linebacker when that's uh, the, the speed is one of the major assets that they need out of that position for the type of defense they play. So uh, nice try there. <laughs> Cover, sort of covering your ass kind of line out of, out of, uh, out of Seaford. Anyway, uh, so next topic, uh, Joe Webb, uh, everybody's favorite backup quarterback. Uh, until you know last year when he didn't make it in the playoffs, but um, Joe Webb is going to be switched back to wide receiver. Um, so you remember we drafted him as a wide receiver, uh, decided to try him at quarterback. Uh, now that we've got Castle uh, as a backup, uh, they're switching him back to wide receiver, and so. <sighs> It's tough to judge w how this is going to play out. Um, I think Joe Webb, having played quarterback, is probably better prepared than a lot of wide receivers for understanding the position, uh, having played quarterback. So quarterback, uh, you need to know the entire playbook. You need to know every aspect of a given play, what the roles of each player on the, on the team, on the offense are, what they're doing in order to make that play work. Um, I don't think a lot of wide receivers really understand uh, uh, understand offensive plays and uh, defenses as well. So as a quarterback, you need to understand both the offensive play and how to read defenses, right? Um, you now, Webb probably wasn't very prepared for doing that, but he's better prepared than a lot of wide receivers who haven't played quarterback. He did play quarterback in college. Um, the uh, a lot of wide receivers I've played with just can't read, read defenses. It drives you nuts. Uh, I play I play wide receiver. I play quarterback. Um, when you expect your what you're playing quarterback, you expect your wide receivers to understand the opening that a defense is presenting to them. When they have a gap in the gap in their defense that the receiver should recognize and run to in order to gain gain uh, yards, because that's obviously where the play should go. Uh, when they don't recognize it, drives you nuts. So um, that's that's my touch football. Obviously, NFL. Is a lot different. Uh, you've got precise routes, timing routes, um, but running your routes properly is another aspect of that. So um, do receivers go right up to a defender and sit down, uh, essentially allowing themselves to be covered? Do they give themselves enough cushion on an out route so that um, the defender can't get to the ball when it's thrown, even if it's a, a timing route? Uh, do they not recognize the cushion that a receiver is giving uh, off the line? Um, can they find soft spots in zone coverage? Do they recognize zone coverage? Uh, do you, you know, do they even look when they're open? So these are a lot of things that you 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 come to uh, a, playing quarterback. You recognize the deficiencies in in receivers' games just based on how they react to a defense. Um, having had that experience, then Webb should be better prepared to uh, play the position of wide receiver. Um, the question is whether he's capable. And given the few times that the Vikings have incorporated trying to throw the ball to um, Webb, I'm not convinced that that he's you know capable of playing the position. Uh, does he have the hands uh, to catch the ball? Uh, does he need to look at the quarterback in order to catch the ball? Can he track the ball in space? Can he uh, run routes properly? I mean, there's a whole host of things that, that you need to know uh, whether he... Um, whether he can play football or play the position or not, and I went back and looked at uh, footage, uh, video footage, to see if I could find an, any of him playing uh, receiver in college, and of course there wasn't. Uh, the the one video out there of him jumping over seven stack dummies is impressive, but gives you no insight into whether he can play receiver. 
receiver. Uh, there's a highlight reel of uh, 2008 University of Alabama at Birmingham highlights uh, that shows a lot of footage of Webb carrying the ball out of the backfield from the quarterback position uh, and doing a fine job of it, but no footage of him catching the ball. So you don't know based on there's no there's no real footage to um, to determine. Uh, what kind of a receiver he's going to be. My, I'm skeptical. Uh, the Vikings carried six receivers on the roster in 2012 last year. Uh, if he does miss, so his competition is Greg Jennings, uh, Jerome Simpson, Jarius Wright, Daryl Patterson, those guys you got to assume are going to be on the roster, right? Um, Greg Childs is somebody who's coming off two blown knees and uh, and may not be ready for the uh, regular season, uh, but seems to have the, yeah. I think the Vikings have a lot of confidence, or not a confidence, but a lot of, uh, uh, they think he's got a lot of talent. The question is whether he can come back from that type of an injury. Um, if he's if he's there, he might be somebody that they try to sneak onto the practice squad, um, or maybe he makes the team, who knows. Uh, but uh, potential potential big talent there uh, with with uh, the size you like in a receiver too. And then the remaining cast that, that Webb is going to really be competing with is uh, Stephen Burton, Chris Summers. Uh, Burton's is, Burton is, uh, was on the roster last year. Um, Chris Summers, uh, practice squad guy, Rodney Smith, Adam Thielen, Eric Highsmith, Lamarck Brown, uh, undrafted free agent guys. And uh, so let's just assume for the sake of argument that Webb does make the roster as like the sixth or fifth or sixth uh, receiver, um, he's going to be going to have to contribute a lot on special teams. Um, so he's super fast. Uh, you could envision him as a gunner on special teams coverage uh, to cover to you know to on kick coverage. Um, I'd put him. I'd experiment with him as a holder on 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 field goals and extra points because that gives you the option of doing some fakes or you know. Um, putting the fear of God into people with uh, needing to cover Joe Webb in case the Vikings do a uh, do a fake field goal and he can juke and you know he's got he's got moves to make people miss and, and get in the end zone um, and then finally uh, imagine him with his speed as and he's shown that in the preseason that he can return a kick or two uh, as a short man on kick returns assuming that you've got Daryl Patterson as your deep man. Uh, on kick on kick returns, I wouldn't put him on punt returns. I don't think he's capable of that. Um, but as a as a kick returner, then you can't kick can't kick short to avoid Patterson, right? Because you've got you've got Webb, who's got just as fast speed. Could be interesting. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, Chris Cluey, uh, former Vikings punter, has uh, signed on with another team. Didn't take long for him to land on his feet. The team that he signed with is. Uh, is uh, the Oakland Raiders, who, of course, uh, um, had a, the best punter in NFL history on their roster back in the 70s in the name of Ray Guy, whom uh, Cluey, of course, um, made a, maybe annoyed his, his special teams coach, uh, Prefer, by uh, putting a patch over his jersey, uh, urging people vote Ray Guy into the Hall of Fame. Um, which he should be in, but uh, but that so there's a connection there between uh, Cluey and the Oakland Raiders. And uh, Cluey originally is from California, so he's returning to uh, his home state. And uh, in 2008, California pra passed Proposition 8, which uh, recognizes marriage as only between a man and a woman. Uh, there's an effort there to repeal Proposition 8. And Cluey has said he would like to get behind that and. Uh, and help repeal it. So he's going to remain an activist with uh, with Oakland. Um, I think he'll do a fine job in, job in Oakland. Uh, so um, so congratulations to Cluey and uh, and good luck to him. The Packers. <laughs> the Packers fans apparently are getting their own reality show. No, it's not HBO Hard Knocks. Um, TBS is apparently developing a show tentatively called Cheeseheads. And it will focus on the lives of Packers fans. So uh, I've done my Wire Packers fans uh, so obnoxious uh, segment before in previous podcasts. So you can look at look at that for my full feelings on the uh, on the uh, subject. But um, I can only imagine this reality show is about trolls. It's about Packers fans hunkered down in their parents' basements, waiting for the next Vikings post to go live online, so they can 
the asses on forums of other teams, <laughs> which they routinely do. Uh, just annoying as hell. Uh, it's got to come from some inferiority complex, but you look at any uh, Vikings forum, you'll find a bunch of Packers trolls uh, being asses on. Uh, or as Randy Farrow from uh, Viking Chat Google Plus page uh, said, thought they already did have a reality show. Isn't it called Redneck Vacation? <laughs> Nicely done, Randy. Uh, so there's that. Uh, we'll wait to see uh, see the uh, uh, Packers reality show. Uh, finally, Viking Stadium design. So the Vikings did unveil their new stadium design. Uh, they will, as I mentioned last week, they will play in TCF Bank Stadium for uh, the 2014-2015 season before moving on to their new digs. Um, this will be the last year of the Metrodome, so let me do a bit of an ode to the Metrodome. Um, the Metrodome had some positives and negatives. Let me go through the positives first. We hosted two World Series championships with the Twins. That was nice. Uh, and uh, the Twins definitely had an advantage playing in the in the dome, with all the lost fly balls that opponents would lose in the in the roof of the Metrodome. Um, for the Vikings, it, it was one of the loudest venues in the NFL. Um, we would routinely have uh, teams get delay of game penalties because they couldn't hear the plays uh, on offense. So uh, the Vikings uh, Vikings fans. Uh, were very loud in that venue, and uh, it was a distinct advantage to the Vikings team itself. The stadium paid for itself, um, so that's good. And, uh, well, you can roller skate in it. I guess that's a positive. I never did it, but uh, I guess that's a positive. It did have plenty of negatives, too. Uh, so the Dome is an awful, awful, awful experience for fans. The suites, which I've been in a couple of games at, are way too far away from the action. Uh, I've had 50-yard line, fourth-row seats, uh, which are way too far away from the action. Um, the acoustics are horrible for concerts. I went to one concert there and would never go to another concert because horrible acoustics. Um, the roof tended to collapse, so there's you know that, that was a problem. Um, and the 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 uh, dome really didn't revitalize the area around it, so there wasn't really a lot to do after the game or before the game. Uh, tailgating was was something you did sort of off-site in parking lots, um, and uh, the only thing around the uh, around the um, dome is Hubert's bar, so uh, didn't really revitalize the area. So the Vikings, uh, with this new design, are emphasizing the fan experience with the, with the new design, so they're very cognizant of the awful experience uh, the dome had. Uh, with better sight lines, a uh, close, closer feel to the action. Um, they are also uh, thinking about the pre- and post-game experience, so they're hoping that people will uh, not just come for a game, but stay afterwards and uh, come before the games. Uh, so, uh, so there's that's good too. Uh, and I will be doing. I'm going to spend more time on this subject, but I'm going to be doing a separate uh, interview with an architect, uh, so we can get a better uh, informed decision about about the design and what what uh, it might bring to the uh, Vikings experience. So, uh, look for that soon. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap this podcast. And uh, so uh, make sure that you go to minnesotavikings.com, minnesotavikingschat.com slash subscribe to subscribe to the email update. If you don't want to miss any of these uh, these podcasts, get them delivered directly to your inbox at minnesotavikingschat.com slash subscribe. Uh, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash minnesotavikingschat. Uh, follow us on Twitter at twitter.com. Uh, slash MN Vikings chat and use the Vikings chat hashtag to talk Vikings online. So uh, we know that you're talking about Vikings, uh, especially during game days. Um, and uh, subscribe. Make sure you subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel so you don't miss any of these podcasts. Until next week, go Vikings. <laughs>